guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh yeah. Cause you're the God who fights 
you gave it all we give it in return
just gonna sing, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. And I believe this morning that if you are struggling with depression, if you're struggling with anxiety, the cares of the world, I believe that there is breakthrough. Jesus is faithful. He thought of you when he was on the cross. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. You are not forgotten. You are not forgotten. Jesus sees you. Jesus saw you and he will not let you run. So we're gonna sing that this morning. We're gonna sing that this morning. We're gonna sing it out in faith. It may not be for you, but it may be for somebody beside you. So we're gonna sing that out with faith this morning. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Come on, we're going to sing that out. You guys sing it. You don't need us to sing. Come on. Shout Jesus from the do communion yet we're going to take a minute and we're going to pray for each other in a minute you know one of the things that probably wrecks me more than anything else is the faithfulness of God and actually seeing him move in people's lives like it just wrecks me you know every time this guy sings a song up here in our church it always reminds me of two years ago he was in a hospital bed two years ago right now he went to the hospital he had covid and it was bad I remember getting the updates from sarah and it seemed like they were very frequently but it was like they're pushing up oxygen to 30 percent they're pushing it to 40 percent it's going to 50 percent it's going up to 60 did it get to 100 90 it was high and this is when people were just people were dying right and then we had this guy who was in the hospital and it did not look good but this whole body started praying constantly praying for this guy and he started to get a little bit better and a little bit better and eventually he was better, but he was still bad. And due to the damage in his lungs, I mean, they told him, this is gonna affect you forever. 
Like we didn't even know if he's ever gonna be able to sing again. You know the breath it takes to like sing good like these people, not like you and me, like these people? Man, and it was bad. But I remember when he came back and sang the very first song, it wrecked me. And now still, every time he sings a song, I'm reminded of the faithfulness of God, that his name is power, yeah. His name is healing, his name is life. And let me tell you something, Jesus is still pursuing people with his gospel and with his power every day. It's not something for back in the day, it's something for right now. Jesus is pursuing you and me in a lost world with his power, with his healing, with his gospel. And so when we sing songs like this, it's just the, my nature is we can sing it and that's awesome. Or we can believe it and do something about it and God will move. He will move. So we're gonna sing a little bit more. They're gonna lead us a little bit more, but we're gonna pray for each other. So every time we do this, I preface this moment with, it takes you being humble and raising your hand and saying, I need someone to pray for me. It takes you being humble and saying, I can't fix this on my own. I need the power of God in my life. And I know what happens on the inside in moments like this, the devil immediately starts speaking. Everybody will know that you have this problem, that you're weak, that fill in the blank if you raise your hand and you ask for prayer. Yep. And God's power is made perfect in your weakness. And he exalts humility. So yes, if you want prayer, you're gonna have to be humble and you're gonna have to admit weakness and you're gonna have to say, I need the people around me to pray in the name of Jesus for me. And so if you need prayer for physical healing in your body, if you are sick, if you have pain, if you need prayer, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand in just a second. If you have anxiety or depression and you need people to speak the truth of scripture over you so you can renew your mind and receive the power of God, we're gonna pray for you. If you need deliverance from something that is oppressing you and holding you back from stepping into what God has for you, then you need to raise your hand and get prayer. Because Jesus' name is healing, it is power, it is life. I love Acts. Silver and gold, I don't have for you. I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk and what happened. So if you need prayer right now, I need you to raise your hand. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> A room this big. I know we got people who need prayer, right? Now listen, if you see people around you with their hand up, then I want you to circle around them and we're gonna pray for them. So if you want, you can go ahead. We're gonna have to move around. If you just wanna ask them, hey, what do you need prayer for? And just a quick, hey, I need prayer for anxiety. I'm struggling with, hey, I need fill in the blank. Let people know. Come on, we wanna awaken and empower you to follow Jesus and pray for each other. So go ahead, get around each other. Jesus 
over depression right now. The past has no hold on you. It is passed away. It is gone. We speak new life, putting off the old, putting on the new right now in Jesus' name. We speak the name of Jesus over every demon and spiritual force of darkness. And we command it, go right now in Jesus' name. There is no room for the forces of darkness in the house of God and the children of God. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. 
If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. Good morning, church. All right. My name is Donna Irvin. I serve on the setup team here at Vertical Life. Yes. And if you guys want to please stand with me and open your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 for the reading of the word. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time, for the time that is past suffices for, what, for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect, to the, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of, de, of debauch, debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that, that though judged in the, fre- in the flesh, the way people, that, the, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Who speak, whoever, speaks, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. All right. We're going to continue on in our letter from uh, Peter where he's writing to a church community or a bunch of communities are spread out in the Roman province and they're experiencing a little bit of an increase in hostility. And uh, so what we're going to do is just kind of continue on through this letter and we're going to get right started verse 11 or verse 1. So if you want to turn there, I'm going to jump right into it today. He says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So what Peter's hitting on at first is our mindsets. Everyone say mindsets. Your mindset is so important, is it not? Like, let me tell you a little bit of a story. So I have this thing at my house. It's a cold plunge. And uh, it's not like one of those fancy ones. I found, you might think I'm crazy after this, but I found this deep chest freezer on Facebook. You're already laughing about this. And I, I, I took it home and I took some caulking and caulked the cracks inside. And then I took a flex seal, you know, that spray as seen on TV. You know what I'm talking about? So I just sprayed it inside, and, I, I, and then I just fill it up with water, and I plug it in to a point to where it gets pretty much a, a sheet of ice over the top of it. And then I unplug it, and I, I plug it in every so often to keep it, uh, pr- right now, low 30s. And so I have different friends who have been wanting to try it. H- have you ever tried a cold plunge before? I know it's a new, new hip trend thing, and you're like, just like when CrossFit came out. Remember when CrossFit came out? It's like this cult. Everybody is talking about CrossFit. How do you know if someone's doing CrossFit? Because they talk about CrossFit. And it's the same thing here with uh, uh, Cold Plunge. I get it, all right? I get it. I jumped in. If you just read some of the research about it, it does wonders for your body. So I jumped in, very cheap version of it. And you got to make sure you unplug it because you don't want to get electrocuted, right? 
And so I have these different friends that want to come over and try it. And I had this one friend, uh, Nathaniel Brubaker. And uh, he's been my friend for, like, just to let you know, I asked for permission to share this story. Uh, he's away right now celebrating his wife's 40th uh, birthday. And so if you, uh, if you have her number, just go, hey, happy 40th. And uh, anyways, he wanted to try it. And uh, I said, hey, Brew. And so when he's getting ready to get in, I was trying to talk to him about his mindset. Like, you got to have the right mind before you get in that water. And I said, hey, Brew. And he's already getting in. He gets in. He sits down and immediately, ah! Ah! He just screams, ah! And he jumps right back out. And he's like, I'm not doing that. I was trying to get his mindset ready for what he was about to experience. Now, he, he came back probably a week later, and he crushed it. So you can make fun of him at first, but then you can celebrate him because he did crush it. Why? Because this time around, he had what? The right mindset. He thought about it. He knew the cost. He knew what he was going to feel. I had another friend come over, and his name is Jordan, and he wanted to try it. And he's like, I want to try it. He's looking at it, and I said, hey, Jordan, hold up a second. Before you get in here, unlike my friend Brew, let me talk to you about your mindset. You have to have the right mindset. I was very, like you might think I'm kind of crazy right now, but I was very intense. You better get your mind right. Your body is going, your, your, your mind is designed that when it feels pain to do what? Run, flee. And so I'm like, hey, Jordan, get your mind right. Like, you need to get your mind right. And I talked to him for a little bit about it. I said, hey, it's going to take about 40 seconds or so, and your body, body is just going to be screaming. But then there's going to come this moment where it's like, oh, all right, I, I got this. So he gets in, he sits down, and guess what? He went the whole one minute, pushed the ice away, sat down, and went the full minute. I tried to get him to stay a little bit longer. He said, nope, heck no. He got out. <laughs> And he said, that's the hardest thing he's ever done. And so, but the difference in those two places were mindsets. And this is what P Peter trying to address us on right here. This church is their mindset. Like you need to know the cost of following Jesus is what he's saying. Like mindsets are extremely, extremely, extremely important. In fact, I think your mindset is wrong. You will actually deflect the will of God in your life. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to what? The patterns of this world, but be transformed by what? Like I say this all the time. I use this passage a lot because I don't know if we quite understand it. We think a, a hot worship service is going to fix our problems. We think that just soaking to some wonderful worship track is going to fix our problems. We think the right finances is going to fix our problems. But Paul is telling us right there, he says, you need to renew your mind and not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by that renewing of your mind so that, that's the key part, so that you may know, discern the will of God. That tells me that you can be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and oblivious to the will of God. Why? Because you haven't renewed your mind yet. Your heart's renewed, your soul is renewed, but your mind is not. So you can literally be deflecting, pushing away, rejecting the will of God in your life if you don't have the right mindset. And Peter is telling them here, hey, the right mindset in this situation is that you are, you are experiencing suffering right now. And there's a very good chance, and we know now looking back on it, that you will experience even greater levels of suffering. And so the mindset that Peter's putting in front of us right now is, have you thought about the cost of following Jesus? Like, have you thought about it? It's like sometimes we're surprised when there's a cost to following Jesus. It's kind of like this. Forgive me if you do this or your little kid is in this right now, but karate. So it's called martial what? Art. It's an art. There's an art to it. I've heard of stories where kids are doing like martial arts or karate and they're, they're practicing. Then they get on a recess and the kid actually punches them. What? They were never trained for actually, actually fighting. It was just an art. Hiya! Hiya! But to actually get hit, what? You just hit me. What just happened? And sometimes I think Christianity is a form of that in the West, is that we're just doing martial arts. We're all in here doing our little routines. Then when we go outside and bam, we get hit, we're like, whoa, I did not see that coming. I didn't expect that kind of cost in following Jesus, right? There's a cost to following Jesus, 
And all of us are going to experience it in some way, shape, form, or another. But my question for you, the thing that you need to ask yourself is this, is can my love for Jesus be bought? Meaning, is there a cost that I'm unwilling to pay and I will deny my allegiance when it comes to that? For some of you, it might be this, like the moment you begin to feel some kind of mockery from friends and stuff, I, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. For some of you, the moment that your allegiance to Jesus costs you your comfort, ah, I'm out. What you just exposed is your, the price for your love for Jesus. Like I, I'm willing to love him. And when I say love, I'm not talking about affections and feelings and all these things. I'm talking about how Jesus defined love, which is what? Obedience. He says, if you love me, you will what? Keep my what? Commands. So can you love him without keeping his commands? If we follow the words of Jesus, the answer is what? No. And so the, that's why I present the question, can your allegiance, can your love for Jesus be bought? For some of you, it's the moment that it may cost you financial security, a job promotion. Ah, I'll love him up until that point, and then I'm going to keep my faith private and personal. I'm not willing to pay that cost. Or for some people, what about if it actually costs you your life? That's the hard one, is it not? Like through this whole letter in 1 Peter, he's just talking about like suffering and willing to pay the price for, for following Christ and encouraging and challenging this group of people. And the questions that we really have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to suffer for him to the point of death? To truly actually suffer for him. You have to think about this. I don't like thinking about it. Who likes thinking about this? Raise your hand. Nope, I would rather think about the Cleveland Browns beating Pittsburgh Steelers tomorrow. That's what I'd rather think about. I was born in Cleveland, just so you know. Thank you. But the thing is, is like, I would rather think about other things, but you have to, ha you have to wrestle with this reality and, and, and come to terms with the fact that you're willing to follow him no matter the price or no matter the cost. And that's what Peter says here. He says this, arm yourselves with whose mindset? The mindset of Christ who suffered in the flesh. The mindset of, of Jesus is what Peter is challenging us to have. And that mindset was this. I will, there's no price tag on my love for you. Even to the point of death. Right? There was no price tag on Jesus' love for us. Even to the point of death. And he's saying, hey, you need to have the same mindset that we will love Jesus even to the place or the point of death. That we are willing to suffer in the flesh. And the beautiful thing about suffering is that when you are willing to suffer for Christ, it's something that you should take much joy in because it's a sign, it's evidence of something deeper at work inside of you. It's a sign of the Spirit of God living and abiding inside of you. So the moment you're able to or willing to suffer in any degree, whether it's losing a friend, whether it's losing a, friend, a family member, whether it's, whether it's saying no to a job opportunity because of your love for Jesus, the moment you're willing to do that, you should celebrate. That's evidence of a deeper work inside of you. And that's what Peter continues on to say here he says for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin there's a greater work taking place in you a greater work you know I think that our response to sin or suffering reveals so much in our life so much one I think it's an affirmation of our salvation the fact that you're willing to lose a friend who you used to run hard with, and I'll say, hey, I can't respond and live this way anymore. I love you, but I love Jesus more. Or family members who say, hey, keep that Jesus self stuff to yourself, and we'll invite you to Thanksgiving. I can't. Because I love Jesus more, and I love you more, and I want to tell you the truth. There's a cost. And when you are willing to suffer for
for Jesus. And some of you right now are experiencing that or you're in the middle of that right now. You're in the middle of it. You feel it, the pressure, the pain. It hurts. It's okay for it to hurt. It's not like, okay, it can't hurt. I got to be stoic. No, you can feel all of it and weep and break. But love Jesus more. And some of you are experiencing it. I'm not oblivious to it. I know. I get scared preaching these things sometimes. I'm like, oh my gosh, like help me love you like this, Jesus. We're all humans in this room. Desperately in need of the Spirit of God in our life. All of us. I'm no different. And so if you're willing to suffer for him in any way, shape, form, or measure, it's pointing to a greater reality of what's going on down in the side of inside of you. You know, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 through 10, John writes this. This is, John's, this is Jesus' arguably his best friend on earth. And this is what he says. No one, what, born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is what? Evident. Right here, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so when we're willing to suffer in the flesh, when we're willing to say no to sin, this is not about perfection. This is about direction. You're running hard after him. You should take so much joy in that because it's an, it's an affirmation of, a sal of your salvation. It's affirmation of, like John says here, of the seed of God being inside of you. Now, if you're unwilling to, to repent of sin, if you're unwilling to say no to sin, if you're unwilling to wrestle with it and try to reject it and, and cry out to God for, for, for strength to overcome it, if you're unwilling to do that, I would be very concerned about your salvation is the seed of God inside of you. But if you're, you're here and you, you wrestle day in, day out, week in, week out, to love him more, to love him more, constantly offering your life to him, man, take joy. Walk out of this church today celebrating. Go buy an ice cream cone and eat all of it. And get another one. Because God's done a great work inside of you. Your willingness to suffer in the flesh for Jesus is a testament of what the Spirit of God is doing inside of you. And you need to take joy in that. Also, I think a response, a response to suffering is this, is that suffering is an excuse to sin for some people. And that's what we have to watch out on. This is where Peter, he's like, hey, you used to live this way. Look at it. All these different things, drunkenness, living in sensuality, passions, drinking parties, lawless idolatry, all these different things. You used to live like that. Don't live like that anyway, anymore. But what happens when you experience suffering in your life or high intense environments or pressures? What do you lean towards? Do you lean towards sin? We're supposed to put those things away. Sometimes we allow difficult seasons to give us permission to live in sin. We allow difficult decisions to allow us to sin. So when, when life is rough, right here, Peter's talking to a church that's in, in an increasing hostile environment. Now, in your life, when life is rough, not only just with persecution because you follow Jesus, but when you're stressed out. Life is difficult and intense. Do you turn to sin? And do you justify it because you say, hey, life is just tough right now. God understands. God understands. Yeah, that's why he died on the cross. Look, this is what Jude says. This passage is, as my brother-in-law says, gnarly. Uh, 
Jude 3 says, Beloved, although I was very eager, he was so excited to write to him about their common salvation. He says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago, ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who do what? Pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is that, is that instead of killing the flesh, you perverted grace. And that's what happens in our culture anymore. Like, instead of killing the flesh, I need you, Holy Spirit, in this moment, times are intense, we justify our decisions to continue to sin. What's your response to suffering? What's your response to difficult times? What's your response to stress? How you respond either affirms that the Spirit of God is living inside of you or it affirms that you're always looking for an excuse to continue in a life of sin. And Peter said, hey, get your mind right. Let's move forward. He continues on here in verse 4. He says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. So now you're no longer running with your old friends. And what happens? They begin to what? Mock you. Make fun of you. Cold shoulder you. Leave you out. Because something is different in you. And so the question that I have for you is this right here. Has my love for Jesus surprised anyone lately? The way you love Jesus, the way we love Jesus as a church and as a people should surprise others. Dang. Like he just, he just, he's just not calling himself a Christian. He's actually loving Jesus. Who would have thought? Has your faith surprised anyone? Has the way you love Jesus surprised anyone? There's so many people in, in this, this room here. There's stories of how you are loving Jesus and it's surprising those around you. I have an email last week of a lady who's loving Jesus with all of her heart and her family is constantly persecuting her and rejecting her. And wrestling with the difficulty of that, the rejection of that. And just encouraging her. One, you're suffering in the flesh. Let that be an area that you take joy in because it's the affirmation of the Spirit of God working inside of you. But also know that Jesus is worth it and keep loving him and loving him. There's stories in, in, in here where a husband will tell me, my wife is blown away by the difference in my life. Why? Because the way you love Jesus. He may not like this, but my brother-in-law and sister-in-law have three kids, and they're adopting three more. And to be out in, in the public, and people are like, hey, what, is this like a boys and girls club? What's going on? Because there's all these kids. And I remember we were at the beach a month or so ago, and this lady asked, hey, what's going on? And he immediately responded, this is my kids, this is my family. And their response is, but why? And his response is, because I love Jesus and I love them. Has your faith, your love for Jesus surprised anyone? Challenged anyone? Peter's telling us here, is that the way that you're, because you're no longer running in the ways that they are running. You're no longer living as the world lived. You're no run, longer running with your old friends that are going to be surprised about it and they're going to attack you. And to oversimplify the question to me is this. Have I, my love for Jesus, surprised anyone? Because it should. Peter continues on. He says, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Judgment. Oh, man, when's the last time we spoke about that in the church? Judgment is real. 
And for some of us, we'll be like, oh, don't be so legalistic, Jeremy. We're so far from that. It's not, it's a laugh. It's a joke. There's a reality that you're going to stand before God and to give an account for your life. It's going to happen. There's no more consequences. We don't have consequences for kids. Don't have consequences. They run over their parents. There's no consequences in, in culture. There's no consequences for overspending. When you, are, when you live with the reality of judgment in mind and that there's consequences for our decisions, it changes the way that you and I will live. And we need to remember that. And he continues here in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things. I'll tell you when he's coming. You ready for this? I don't know. People have been predicting it for centuries, for years, for generations. But I'll tell you what. You can feel the intensity. You can feel that things are, are, are getting more intense and aggressive. You can feel what, what Jesus says, the labor pains intensifying, coming closer and closer together. You know, I don't know if you've ever been with a, a lady as they're having a baby or they begin to experience contractions, but it starts off kind of very spread apart. And then what happens is they get more intense and get what? Closer together. And then what happens is finally there's a, the, the baby is born. But there are signs leading up to that. And what you can see in culture and when you can, what you can't see in the world is that these contractions, if you will, are intensifying. And we need to live with an understanding that he is going to return. And so my question for you is, are you prepared? Are you ready? If I was to tell you, hey, he's returning tomorrow, what would change in your life? I know we have all have kind of like these extreme responses. Well, shoot. But the reality is, is like I, will, I love what one pastor said. He said nothing because he's living the life that he should be living. He's being faithful. And we should be able to answer that nothing. Because I am living with that in mind. I'm living with his return in mind. We should prepare as if he's not coming for 100 years but we should live as if he's coming tomorrow. If he was returning tomorrow, what changes in your life? That will expose areas that you may need to give some attention to. So Peter goes on here and he tells us, you know, living with the end of mind, what, this is how you should live. This is how you should live in a hostile culture this is how you live, should live with him returning in mind. This is how you should live in a way that will surprise others. And so I have five things to kind of just challenge you and encourage you with for you to, to live these things out in your own life. And I called it this. Five ways to surprise others and please Jesus. Sounds pretty good, right? Five ways to surprise others and to please Jesus. And I know how many of you, you want to do that. We want to do that, right? The first thing is this, live simply. You know, Peter's challenging him here to be self-controlled and sober-minded, which means you're living, you're living intelligently and not intoxicated by the things of this world. Like your priorities are right. And some of us, we need to simplify our life, we're over, overburdened. And right now, a common thing I'm hearing, and listen, I'm going to say this as respectful as I can, and it's a true biblical principle, but the principle of Sabbath. And we're saying, hey, I got a Sabbath, I got to rest, I got Sabbath, I got to rest. Not realizing that in those times, those people were working 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week. So you're talking about 60 to 72 hours of work a week. And they would Sabbath. Our problem, I don't think, is how much we're working. Our problem is all the burdens and unnecessary cares that we're carrying. 
And no amount of rest is going to do that for you. You get Sabbath from now to the end of the year, but until you let go and simplify your life, you're never going to find rest. For some of you, you need to work more, to be honest. And so declutter your life, declutter your emotions, the unnecessary cares and concerns that you have. Declutter things. Like how about downgrade your life a little bit, downsize it a little bit. Sometimes we're so stressed out, so anxious. It's because we have a reason to be. We're trying to figure out if we can pay next month's mortgage because maybe we bought a house that was unnecessary. Finances, decluttering your finances, decluttering your time. We're running and running and running and running. So I think the first thing that we can do if we want to live in a way that's going to surprise others in a way that's going to please Jesus is just, let's, how about we just simplify our life? We could all use a little bit of that, right? Just decluttering areas of our life, simplifying it. You know, back in this time about the Sabbath and they were concerned about what? Three things, loving God, loving their family, and working well. We're concerned with everything. We're overwhelmed with all kinds of information, all kinds of desires, all kinds of unnecessary things. And if you want to live in a culture with a way that surprises, other and ple- surprises others and please Jesus, then the first thing you can do is just simplify your life. It's not that complicated. Just simplify it. You need to learn to say no. Everyone practice it. Now, that's not for everyone. Some of you, you need to learn to say yes because you never say yes. The second thing is this, is pray strategically. It talks about here that we live this way for the sake of our prayers. Begin to be a person of prayer. And when I say this, have targets that you're praying for. No areas that you're focusing on, areas where you want to see God move. And if you don't know how to pray, pray through Scripture. Open up Scripture and begin to pray it. And when we do our Tuesday night corporate prayers, come and join us in those because that's what we do. We pray through Scripture. We teach you how to pray through Scripture. Now, right now, pray that we find a location because the church that we were renting at, they need, the, they need their building for that night. And that's why we haven't had it for the last couple of weeks We're aggressively looking for a location to be able to pray at and to do worship practice at. So pray for those things. But learn to pray through Scripture. So be strategic in the way that you pray. And sometimes, you know, our prayers is just a revelation of what our hearts are consumed with. And it's just me, 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 me. Like if you look at your prayer journal, is is it all about you? Be strategic in the way that you pray. The third thing is this, is love boldly. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Above all means that you are are making this a priority in your life, that you're going to love people well. And this word for love here isn't about a feeling or emotion. It's a decision. I love this um, I can't remember exactly how it played out, but in the, in the Chosen series, there's this scene with Jesus. He's talking to his disciples, and one of his disciples says, but what if I don't feel it? What if I don't feel it? And Jesus said, I don't need you to feel anything. I need you to do it. And for some of you, that would bring so much freedom in your life. Jesus doesn't need you to feel anything. He needs you to do it. It's like my kid telling me, I don't feel like taking out the trash. Excuse me? I don't need you to feel anything. (laughs) I need you to do it. And for some of us, this is what he's saying that we need to be able to do in our own life is be be people who love well. Do you love well? And then he continues on here and he says, since love covers what? A multitude of sins. So what is he saying? He, he knows that when the pressure is turned up, it becomes difficult to love. Things begin to fray, and there's opportunity for offense. 
Husbands and wives, when life is stressful, it's so much easier to be offended at one another, is it not? You know, when, when new parents, I have four kids, two of them are teenagers, one thinks she is, and the other one is seven, eight. <laughs> the reality is this, is that when new parents come and ask me, hey, for tips, they just had a baby. Like, I'm very practical in my advice. One, buy concrete and leather, everything. They destroy everything. Parents, amen, right? Everything. Like, my daughter and her little cousin were caught, they would hold onto the garage door as the one would push it and they would just take a joy ride. <laughs> Why? Because children destroy everything. The second thing that I tell, I tell them is, listen, if you're planning on going anywhere, like you know when you go out and you do things and say you, you usually leave, leave at a, a right on the dot and get out, give yourself about 15 to 20 minutes more time. Why? Because you're going to think you have time and that little, little tyke is going to poop his pants <laughs> or you're going to get in the car and your wife is going to ask you, did you get the diaper bag? What? I thought you got... And what happens is the environment is tense and it leads to what? Offense. Being offended, uh, offended at each other. And what Peter's telling us here is that in this culture, hey, pressure is hot. It's high. It's intense. And the opportunity to, to be offended is great. And we need to be people who are not easily offended. Are you easily offended? Are you easily offended in your relationships? Are you easily offended within the church? And what he's telling us here is that we need to be people who are not easily offended. I love what Brant Hansen says. He says, choosing to be unoffendable out of love for others is a ministry. That when we walk in here and we do life together and we follow, follow Jesus together, we are not people who are easily offended. That there's not these little hidden offense minds all around you. Some of you, you know those people? You might be those, that person. Do not nudge the person beside you. But, you know, they got these little hidden offense minds. It's like when you walk into their life, you're like navigating. Real, well, dink. Oh, no. <laughs> We're not to be those types of people. He continues, uh, uh, Brent Hansen, I, there's a few quotes. I love these quotes. I, I think they're worth reading to you. Brent Hansen says that few want to hear this, but it's true, and it can be enormously helpful in life. If you're constantly being hurt, offended, or angered, you should honestly evaluate your inflamed ego. Come on. I don't know who said that, but Amen. Are you easily offended? If so, then you are, let me say this with gentleness and kindness, you are immature in your love, and you could be an access point for the devil in your marriage, your life, or this church. He looks for offense, defends people, and it's an access point. And the devil will use that to get into your marriage, into your family, or even into this church. John Bevere says this, an offended heart is the breeding ground for deception. When you give way to offense and unforgiveness, you place yourself in opposition to the Holy Spirit's work within you. And none of us want to do that, right? Do not be easily offended. The fourth thing is this. Be radically hospitable. Show hospitality to one another without what? Grumbling. Now listen, my wife loves to be hospitable. She loves to have people over. And this is an area that I have to work on. I just feel like I don't have enough space and so I might want to grumble about it, but that's wrong of me. We're called to be hospitable people. Are you hospitable? Are you kind? Are you serving? Are you loving? Do you open up your home? I love what Rosaria, uh, Rosaria Butterfield says. What a name. Those who live out radically ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. That is good. He, she continues on to say, knowing, and now, what, hope, don't pull, 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 delete that. Some of us will be like, well, it's not my personality. This is not who I am. Now we'll pull it up. 
Knowing your personality and your sensitivities does not excuse you from ministry. It means that you need to prepare for it differently than others might. For some, this comes natural. Raise your hand if that's you. It's natural. Man, we don't have very many hospitable people. Raise your hand if that's you. Come on. Raise your hand if that's not you. We need to work on it. I need to work on it. My wife, she loves to be hospitable. In fact, if you get her to come over, she's not one of those people that's going to bring a bag of chips. She's going to make like a gluten-free dessert, a regular dessert, a protein dessert, and a salad. It's like, dang. She's hospitable. The fifth thing is this. Put your gifts to work. He says here, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I want to read a passage to you that has challenged me. It's in Colossians 1.25. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for who? For you to make the word of God fully known. That means their, that church's body or ability to experience God's gift was based on Paul's willingness to steward it and to use it. So this is a challenge. What gifts has God given this body through you and we will never experience it because of your unwillingness to steward it and to serve the body with it? Instead, self-preservation and selfishness you hold it to yourself and there's areas of this body that we will never be be able to experience the gifts that God has given us because of our unwillingness to steward it and to use it and to serve one another with it ask your neighbor are you robbing me go ahead are you robbing me is there a gift that God's given are you robbing me and what Peter is saying here he's saying hey no gifts in the body should be unemployed. Is your gift unemployed? It's just not the right season. Then it means it's not the right season for us too then, that God gave it to the body, but we don't get to experience it until you're ready and your calendar works out just right? No. As Paul says here, a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. He had a responsibility to steward it so that that church body could experience it. And there's so many awesome, mighty gifts in this room that this body is supposed to be experiencing. And I'm so proud of those ones that we are experiencing it. You're stewarding it well, thank you. But there's more. And don't downplay your value in this body. There's people that still come to this church, not because of the worship or because of the preaching, but because of your relationship with them, your friendship with them. Don't downplay your value in the gift that God has given you to mature and to grow this church body. Amen. So five things he says, live simply. You want to know what to do? Live simply, pray strategically, love boldly, be radical, radically hospitable, and put your gifts to work. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to call the prayer team forward. If you need prayer for anything, these individuals want to pray with you. And I'm going to pray over you and let you go. Father, I just thank you for this mighty body, this mighty church. I thank you for this church that's maturing and growing in, our, in their love, in their obedience to you. And I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you just encourage them, that you just strengthen them. I thank you for a spirit of might to rest upon this body. I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. I thank you that we would be more aware of your love than any mountain in front of us. And I just declare grace over this body in Jesus' name. Come on, church, and we put our hands together and we say amen. Love you guys. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.